Well, good morning. My name is Jared Perry. I'm one of the assistant youth pastors here at Grace Bible Church. You probably haven't seen me in a while because I am over at our Southwood campus, uh, but I'm excited to be back here at Anderson. Uh, I attended the Anderson campus here whenever I was in college uh, and then started here whenever I started at Grace. And so this is a, a place that holds uh, a near and dear place in my heart. So um, we're going to be in James 1, chapter 20, verse 27 today. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open those up so we can read this passage this morning. Um, I also want to commend you for being here on Time Change Sunday because 11 o'clock is really 10 o'clock to all of us and no bueno. Um, so uh, we're in James chapter 1, verse 27, and I'm going to read for you from the scripture. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning, for this day that we have to come and worship you and praise you for the victory that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. For the victory that you brought to us, the victory that you give to us by grace through faith in him. And we thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather and study your word, to look at it, see its truth, and to allow its truth to work and move in our hearts. Father, I pray that it would do that. I pray that we would become people who are more like you <coughs> and that we could live more faithfully to the call that you've given to us. And I'm going to ask you guys if you would take a second to pray for yourselves as well. Pray that God would move and work in your heart. Maybe you are tired from the time change or excited about spring break. Pray that this morning that you would be able to focus and that the truth of this text would not pass you by, but it would take deep root in you. Take a second and pray that also for those around you. If you know their names, please use their name. If not, that's okay. Pray that that their weariness from the time change or their excitement about spring break wouldn't distract them either and that they would be able to be moved by this truth of the scriptures. And finally, please pray for me. Uh, this text in which James says his pure and undefiled religion is weighty to me and I want to, to do it justice and do it well. So pray that the Spirit would move and speak through me and it would not be my words. Well, Father, we pray these things in hope in your faithfulness and your goodness. And we ask them in your Son's name by the Spirit. Amen. After being in the car for what had felt like days, I was exhausted, I was sore, and I was starving. My family was making a trip from college or from Houston all the way up to Colorado in order to go skiing. And if any of you have made that road trip, you know that eventually the peanuts and the M&Ms can't overcome the weariness and the tiredness and the fact that you just need to get out and stretch your legs. You've been fighting with your sibling about what music you're listening to or who gets the Game Boy and it's just you need some fresh air. And so we pulled into the state of Colorado and we passed the big sign that said, welcome. And we drove in and my dad said, okay, it's time. We can stop for some food. And I was excited. And so sure enough, we saw Wendy's and I was going, okay, that's great. Because now I have this image of a juicy cheeseburger, some crispy French fries, and of course, a nice cold Dr. Pepper. And that was going to just solve all my problems. I was ready to go. In fact, when we stopped and we pulled in, I was the first one out of the car. I was the first one to the cashier's register, and I was all ready to order. And I said to her, I'll have a Texas double cheeseburger. And before I could even get to the French fry part, she stopped me and said, what? Surely I had misspoken. Maybe I was so hungry it had come out as like a groaning or something like that. I don't know. So in my head, I said, okay, I'll, I'll slow down. I've been ordering Texas Double Cheeseburgers for a few years now. Maybe you're new. Let me help you out. I'll have a Texas Double Cheeseburger, and I'll never forget the look on her face as she told me, we don't serve those here. Because it took me about five seconds to realize they probably don't serve Texas Double Cheeseburgers in the state of Colorado, right? We're Texans. We love Texas. I don't know that Coloradans love Texas as much as we love Texas. And so they didn't have a Texas double cheeseburger. And the reality was that I had seen this, right? We had passed the sign that said, welcome to Colorado. I should have known. I should have recognized that this was going to have an implication on what 
hamburger I was going to order, which don't worry, I got a double meat, double cheese. It was delicious, right? But the reality was that even though I saw this truth and I saw this reality of the fact that I've entered into the state of Colorado, the implications of that didn't sit with me as deep as they should have. I didn't realize that this was going to change even how I would order at Wendy's. Likewise, I think sometimes we do this with the truth of Scripture, that we will read truths of Scripture and we will see them and get excited about them and think they are good. But the reality is that we don't let the depths of what they mean fully take root in our hearts. So as we look at James Chapter 1, verse 27 this morning, I want us to pause. I want us to ponder. I want us to think well about this passage because James is telling us this is pure and undefiled religion. Not this is all religion. James is not claiming this is everything there is to religion, but he is saying these are foundational pieces to who we are and what we do. This is foundational Christianity. And so if you've read this verse before and thought, oh, that's good. Those are good things to care about. This is more than that. There are more implications to what this is saying for us because the truth of the matter is this. The sacrificial care that God displays in the gospel compels his people to sacrificially care for the orphan, the widow, and the world. This is not merely a passage about Christian living, but it's telling us about the very heart of the gospel and the very heart of our God. Because the sacrificial care God displays in the gospel compels his people to sacrificially care for the orphan, the widow, and the world. This term pure here in the Greek, it, it carries this idea of innocent, carries the idea of clear, of clean. And so James is, is telling us this is clean religion. This is innocent religion. This is clear religion for us. This is foundational to who we are. And it's founded in the heart of God that's been displayed for us in the gospel. So let's break this down. Let's talk about then what does that mean? What does this look like? Well, first, let's look at sacrificial care to the orphan. Sacrificial care to the orphan. It's there in verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Now this term visit for us can carry some different connotations. I don't know about you, but sometimes you can have to go visit people that you don't want to visit. Maybe you're thinking of a family member. I'm not, but maybe you are, right? Like maybe there's somebody in your life that you think about, we have to go see this person for a holiday, or we have to go visit the doctor because I'm sick. And that's not necessarily something I want to go do, but I have to go to this visit. It's an obligation. Maybe it's a teacher if you're in school, or a TA, you have to go visit them in order to talk about your grades or talk about a test score. And it's not something you look forward to. The term here in the Greek is different. The term here in the Greek is used in Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Jesus has come into the world and there are two people that are going to make prophecies and proclamations out of exclamation because of who God is and what he's done. And in verse 68, Zechariah says, about the coming of John the Baptist and the coming of Jesus says this, blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people. See, this was not a term that the, that the Greeks would use to talk about obligation. The term visit is a term that they use to talk about intentionality and care. Christ came to us because he intentionally cared for us and likewise when James, tell, James tells us to care for the orphans, he says so to, because we're supposed to visit them in care and intentionality. That's what we've been called to. And as you think about the affliction of the orphan, it makes sense. The orphan who has lost their family, their parents, right? Their parents who were meant to love them, their parents who were meant to nurture them, their parents who were meant to disciple them. This orphan now has lost those things. And God has called us to care for them, to reach into their lives the same way that he visited us. And it's a beautiful, beautiful picture of the gospel. And it's consistent with the theme in the heart of God. If we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, if you go all the way back to the moment when Adam and Eve sinned, before God enters into the garden, and before Adam and Eve hide from the Lord, what happens? They feel shame between one another. Sin has entered into the world, and they feel separation between one another. And Adam and Eve have to separate themselves. 
Because sin brings brokenness even in our families. And sin wounds our families and makes them not what God intended for them to be. And yet, even in that moment, even in Genesis chapter 3, we look back now and see God was promising an answer. That God says he will send the seed of a woman who will crush the head of the serpent because God was promising to fix this issue of the family stress, the family brokenness that had entered into our world because of sin. God said, I'm going to take care of that. And from the very beginning, the heart of the Lord was to care for families. And so if you go forth and you keep reading in Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, the Lord is offering the law to his people, to Israel. He's telling them how they should live. And so he's speaking to Moses so that Moses can command the people. And so he gives the Ten Commandments. And you keep reading and you look and you get to Exodus chapter 22. Still as God is giving the law to his people, what does he say? Chapter 22, verse 22. You shall not mistreat the widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword. Some intense stuff. But the heart of God is for the orphan, it's for the fatherless, it's for the family. And so throughout history, God has been caring for the family and wanting to restore the family. There's one other instance of this youth, of this Greek word for orphan in the New Testament. One other instance. John 14, 18, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. See, we were orphaned. We were orphaned. We were without a family. We were without our father. We'd been separated from God. And Jesus says, I will not leave you this way. I will not leave you fatherless. I will not leave you without a family. I will come visit you in your affliction and I will be there And what he had to do for us was sacrifice, that God looked at us and said, I love you enough that I'm willing to sacrifice the son on your behalf in order that you can be restored, that you can have a family again, that our relationship as father and child can be restored. It took sacrifice, but God sacrificially cares for the orphan. He sacrificially cares for us. And now, because that's true in the gospel, he's compelling us to sacrificially care for the orphans that we see in our world the orphans that are around us. That's why this is pure and undefiled religion because it's pure and undefiled, the heart beat of God. We are called to sacrificial care of the orphan. Now there's a lot of questions for us here because a lot of us are at different life stages and there's a lot of good reasons not to care for orphans, right? For one, you may be in high school. You don't need an orphan in your house if you're just in high school, right? You don't need to take care of them. That's not wise. There's some good reasons not to care for orphans in the way that we particularly think about it in the sense of bringing them into your home. But all of us are called to sacrificially care for them. And so let's talk about some different ways that you could do that regardless of what life stage you're in. Maybe you're sitting here saying, Jared, I'm too young to care for an orphan. I'm too young to be there. Can I tell you, that while you may not be the one bringing them into your home, there are other needs that orphans have. They need to be fed. And as a family brings them into their home, as a family brings an orphan through foster care or adoption into their home, they need help. And maybe you, you with your roommates or you with your siblings could provide food for a family that is caring for orphans. Maybe that family needs help with yard work or with their home. They need help with people who can clean as the parents are investing in this new child and investing in this child who has been through trauma. Maybe you can say, hey, I will come and I will mow your lawn every week. I will come and I will help clean your bathrooms. I will come and visit these orphans and visit these families that are caring for orphans by sacrificing my time to come be there for you. Maybe you'll sacrifice your time and get licensed to babysit. For people who are going through foster care, You can't just bring in any babysitter. There are certain things that they have to do to go through the process. That includes getting a background check. It includes CPR training. Those things take time that you have to sacrifice, but you sacrifice them in order to care for these orphans because they have a need. They have a need and these families have a need and you can help them. I've loved in our youth ministry, we've been able to benefit an organization called Faithful to the Fatherless that we support here at Grace Bible Church. 
And as part of Faithful to the Fatherless, we offer free babysitting nights for any family that's fostering or adopting in our community. And these families come up here, and I'll never forget the first time we had a free babysitting night, we had a couple tell us that this was the first time they'd been able to get out on a date since they'd had their kids in. It'd been 10 months. And because our kids were willing to sacrifice a Monday evening, it was able to make a difference in this couple's lives. I love that. Because you don't just have to bring a kid into your home to be able to care for orphans. All of us can be a part of this process. Maybe you're saying I'm too old. Maybe you're saying I'm, I've got kids who are in college or getting out of college. I've got grandkids, Jared. I can't have kids in my home now. That's fair. That's fair. But what about helping families that are having kids in their home? We have a, an opportunity through something called our foster pantry where we are taking strollers and car seats and toys and clothes and shoes so that families who are bringing orphans into their home can find resources they need to be able to care for these kids. What if you were to care for the orphan in that way? What if you were to care for the orphan by giving of your time and your money to help build that foster pantry so these families would know you are not gonna be in want. These kids are not going to be in want. What if you were to make the meals? What if you were to help these families out? There's a lot of options for you. But maybe you are at the life stage where it is the right time, and you're just saying, Jared, there's, there's other things going on. There's stuff happening. I get that. There's reasons to not have an orphan into your home. But there's also opportunities to sacrifice. There's also things that the Lord is calling us to sacrifice in order to care for these kids. Things that are good things that the Lord is saying, I need you to give this up. I need you to give up this thing that you want to hold on to that you think is keeping you from being able to care for orphans. I need you to give that up so that you can have a child into your home, a child who needs a family. As of February in Brazos County, there were something more than 50 um, kids who had been taken away from their parents uh, or had lost parents and they were orphans and they needed a home to go to. Uh, for foster care that could have potentially led to adoption or maybe not. We just weren't totally sure. Over 50 kids in Brazos County, a little more than 20 of them were able to, to be placed in homes here. So 30 kids, in addition to be taken away from their families, had to be taken away from <laughs> the place that they live and sent to different places and different homes for people that were willing to step up and care for them. Church, it breaks my heart. We have to be willing to help each other out. We have to be willing to stand up and say, I will sacrifice and I will serve and I will care because Christ himself cared for us as orphans. He came and he sacrificed. So what role can you play? What thing can you sacrifice in order to be a part of this thing that is in the very heart of the gospel? It's in the very heart of God. He calls us not just to care for orphans, by having them in their home, our home, and I love this image that our graphic designer came up with. I think it's great. Um, because it, it's this great picture of all these different ways that you can care for a child. Where You may be the one providing the home for them, but you may be the one providing the meals, as you see. Or you may be the one providing the medical care. God has blessed you in different ways. Each of us has an ability to reach out to these kids. What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to give up in order to make a difference for them? God has displayed sacrificial care for us. And one of the ways I would encourage you to get connected is to go to faithfultothefatherless.com. This is a place where you can connect with um, the Klausners and some other people in Faithful to the Fatherless that can help you think through ideas, uh, help you engage with some of the ideas I presented today. Another thing you can do is join a Facebook group. Uh, it's called Faithful to the Fatherless and Friends. It's a good place where people who are taking care of orphans in our community talk about what's going on and what they have needs and how you can help. And so maybe that's an avenue that works best for you. But what are you willing to sacrifice? How are you willing to be compelled by Christ's example of sacrificial care to visit these kids? He not only calls us sacrificial care for the orphan, but also sacrificial care for widows. These are similar but different, as we see in verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God is this to visit orphans and widows in their afflictions. The affliction of a widow is different. 
In James's day, the widows were in a very vulnerable situation. Financially, emotionally, in a number of different ways, there was vulnerability there. And so the early church made it one of their missions to care for widows, to make sure that they were provided for. And so the reality is that as we think about visiting widows, as James calls this community to visit the widows in their affliction, he wants to recognize their vulnerability, but also recognize their loss. Recognize that these people are dealing with the fact that what God has intended, which was life together, has been taken from them and they've experienced loss. If we think back to Genesis chapter 3 again, what happens? Adam and Eve are separated from one another. They're separated from the Lord. And part of that consequence that God tells them is that from the dust you were formed and to the dust you shall return, the consequence of sin is death. The consequence of sin is loss for us. And we are experiencing a world with separation from those we were supposed to be knit together with that God never intended. And there's a brokenness there. There's an emptiness there. There's loss there. And it's hard. It's hard. In our day, we're experiencing that in different ways as we have single parents, single moms and single dads, different people suffering with different afflictions who are experiencing that vulnerability, that loss. And James calls us to visit these people. He calls us to intentionally care for them, to sacrificially care for them. And this is consistent with the heart of God. As again, we think about Genesis chapter three where God calls us and promises to us that he will send a savior, one to crush the head of the serpent. We think about Exodus 22, again, where God demands that we care for the widow alongside the orphan. But we also think about this. We think about Revelation chapter 21. As Tim saying about the victory that we have in Christ, the victory that is coming, here's what the scripture says about that victory. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things that passed away. God has in the heart of his gospel worked a hope that the death and the pain of loss would be taken away from us. That we wouldn't have to experience it anymore. Because God cares for those who are experiencing the effects of this sin, the effect of brokenness. He cares for those who have lost and God has worked to give us hope. So what does this look like? Last semester, I lost my grandfather. This is the first grandfather uh, or grandparent that I've lost and it was hard. He passed away here in town and within an hour I was at the hospital and there's n- nothing anyone can say that can prepare you for that. Um, to see your grandmother grieving, for you yourself to be grieving, for that experience in that moment and just the emptiness and the loss that comes. You can't be prepared for it. I've been so thankful for the opportunity that my grandmother lives here that we've been able to spend time with her, but one of the coolest things that I've seen is this lady who lives across the street from her who has decided without knowing us really or being close with our family that she is gonna take her child and go hang out with my grandmother. And from time to time, they go visit them. They will go over and spend time with her and talk with her and see how she's doing. And she's gone out of her way to care for my grandmother. It's amazing. Her family's in town. My aunt's here with her kids and my wife and our kids are here and we get to see my grandmother. But this woman said, this woman is experiencing a loss. And I should care for her. And so what does that look like for you? Who in your life is experiencing loss and is in a vulnerable place that you can care for? Maybe one of the best places you can go is to our Alms ministry. These are older saints that are a part of our community. And Jerry Parkerson has helped heading up, working with this, this group of people. One of the best things that you might be able to do is to email Jerry. I'm going to put his email address up here and be able to talk to him and say, hey, these are a group of people that I want to serve, I want to care for, I want to be there for. How can I help? Jerry knows these people. He could really, really help you in this process of figuring out how to live out pure and undefiled religion. Maybe for you, 
there is a neighbor. There's a neighbor that as I was sharing my story that you thought about, a neighbor that you know who has lost someone and you can be there for them. But it takes sacrifice. It takes you coming home from work or coming home from school and being tired but being willing to say, yes, I'm tired, but that person has lost and I want to care for them. I want to be there for them in their pain. Maybe it's someone who's a part of your sports team or someone who's a part of your kid's sports team, a single parent who's trying to juggle a job and kids and volleyball or basketball or baseball practices. Maybe for you, it looks like helping take their kid to and from practice. It, helps, it looks like helping them with meals. The reality is I wish I could stand up here and tell you this is exactly what it looks like to care for the widows or the orphans in your community I wish I could give you something because then we could walk away and say, yes, that Grace Bible Church, they are doing pure and undefiled religion. We're getting it right. But honestly, the best way you can care for people sometimes is just to listen, just to know them, know what's going on. And I can't sit here and tell you everything that the people in your life need. It's gonna take you sacrificing the easiness of a clear application from a stage and being willing to get into the messiness of somebody's life and figure out how can I care for you? How can I give myself up to be a part of what you're going through? God has set this example for us. He did it in the gospel and now he's compelling us sacrificially care for orphans, sacrificially care for widows. But there's one more piece to this puzzle. God calls us to sacrificial care for the world. Now, this one's a little tricky, so I want you to hang with me while I explain this and walk this through. The end of verse 27 says this. Not only are we to visit orphans and widows in their afflictions, but we're also to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, this idea of to keep, it's an interesting verb. It's a verb that's active. It's a verb that's continuing. It's a verb that tells us we are supposed to be on our guard. And when you're guarding something, you're supposed to stay alert. It's not just I stand up and I guard it one time, one moment, and then it's guarded. You have to continue to stand guard. You have to continue to keep yourself unstained by the world. And we think of that, and I think of that, and I think of Silly Songs with Larry. Okay? Now, I have a three-year-old. Uh, and he has in- reintroduced Silly Songs with Larry to me. Uh, if you don't know, you should praise the Lord for that when you go home. Um, the Silly Songs will just get in your head, and that's all you can think about. But uh, Larry is a cucumber, uh, and he on Netflix uh, will invent these silly songs that he sings that my kids love. Of all the silly songs that I remember so fondly from my youth, like Water Buffalo and I Love My Lips, there was a new song that I'd heard for the first time on this silly song episode that we let the kids watch. And this song is called Sippy Cup, all right? And so for Sippy Cup, if you don't know, let me tell you, Larry the Cucumber goes to this restaurant and when he gets to the restaurant, he asks for a glass to drink from and the wait staff freaks out because they remember Larry and Larry has a tendency to spill things, right? And so the waiter says, no, 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 we can't give you a sippy cup. I have here in my notes all the stains from when you had spilled all this stuff before. And then he says, no, 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 I don't, I, I don't want a sippy cup. People will make fun of me. Give me something else. And so then they call a busboy and then they call the maitre d' and they call all these people to Larry and Larry's trying to make his case. And then somehow magically a judge appears in this restaurant. I don't know. It's a silly song. So... Everybody has said, Larry, no, we have to give you a sippy cup. And then the governor of Vegetable Town or whatever it is calls in and says, give Larry a glass. And so sure enough, the waiter comes over and brings Larry a glass of grape juice. And he goes to take a drink. And as he takes a drink, I guess his cucumberness makes him stumble. And he spills the grape juice everywhere and runs out. See, because the concern was exactly what happened, that Larry would spill and leave a stain everywhere. And so everyone wanted him to have a sippy cup because they wanted him to be safe. They didn't want him to be able to spill on nice things. And at times as Christians, we freak out and we think that's what this passage is saying, that we all need sippy cups and that we need to remove ourselves from the brokenness and the hard things of the world that could hurt us. And so we read this and think James is saying, keep yourself safe at all costs. No one gets a glass, everyone gets a sippy cup because our goal is to be safe. 
I would argue James is saying exactly the opposite, and here's why. When sin entered into the world in Genesis chapter 3, God himself looked down at what was happening, and he in his justice and his righteousness and his mercy could have said, mankind is too broken, too dirty, that world is too messed up for me to enter into it. I'm going to stay up here where it's safe. But you know what he said? He said, I love these people so much that I will send my son, not just to walk with them on this earth, but to take on their human flesh, their broken human bodies. My son will take it on in order that I might bring good to them, in order that they might be rescued. God says that in order to be unstained by the world, the answer is not to retreat, but it's to engage. And God in his righteousness says, I am not threatened by your depravity, but I am bringing hope to you. And so Christian, as we have read this passage and thought, I need to pull away, I need to pull away, there is wisdom in how we keep ourselves unstained from the world. There is wisdom in considering what the world is teaching us and telling us we have to be wise there. But we also have to remember that our God has modeled a sacrificial care for the world. Our God has modeled through the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, the fact that he is willing to get down here in our messiness, in our brokenness, in order to make a difference. We look in Hebrews chapter nine, and the scripture says this, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? See, what happens is, when Christ's blood comes over us, his blood doesn't get stained by our guilt and our shame and our sin. His blood makes our hearts clean. He stains us for good. And through his sacrificial care, he's not just able to keep himself unstained, but he's able to stain us for good. It's like the wood beam that we put in our mantle place when we were building our home. I could have yelled at my kids a lot about how to not make that wood beam get dirty, right? Stop throwing the chalk. Stop doing this thing. Because it could hit the wood beam and leave a mark. Or I could take stain, a beautiful wood finish, and put it on that wood beam that protects it, yes, but also makes it beautiful. It makes it good. God has called us to be staining this world for good, to be a part of his process of bringing hope, of bringing victory, of bringing restoration into this world, not just retreating from it, not just keeping ourselves safe. So the question is, what does this look like for us? For me in high school, I thought, the pinnacle of my religion was sitting with my friends at lunch and correcting them every time they cussed, right? I said a lot of darns and a lot of shoots, right? And that's okay. There's a good thing to taming my tongue. That's good. That's righteous. That's healthy. There's a good process to me making sure that I am filtering my words and filtering my thoughts well. That's good. However, what I never did with any of those guys that I can remember is talk about the truth of the gospel, And talk about the fact that Jesus Christ came down because he loved us so much. That he loved these guys so much that he would sacrifice himself for us. And that God had orchestrated this whole plan in order to fix the brokenness of this world. I'd never told him that. Because I was so busy keeping myself safe. There's a balance there and we have to find it. And again, I don't know what it looks like for you. I don't know where the places are in your work where somebody there is just not walking with the Lord. They're not a believer, or maybe they are a believer and they're walking in sin, but it's a sinful place. I don't know what it looks like for you to keep yourself safe, but I do know that you're called to be safe, but also be making a difference in their life to be getting to know them and knowing what their hurts are because Christ knew us and knew what our afflictions were. And you've been called to make a difference in their life. You've been called to be able to reach out to them. I don't know what that looks like for you in school, in class, where you go and you want to go sit with the Christians. You want to go sit with the people who love the Lord. But there are people there that need 
to know Jesus Christ. And they need you to help bring him to him. We are called to sacrificially care for this world, to give ourselves up in hard conversations, in awkward situations, in order that we can make a difference. In order that people may know the one God who saves, that may become a part of this family, and they may know the hope that Jesus has given us. And the reality is that this is a deep-rooted truth for us. God has called you to this. God has asked this of you, and it looks good on paper, but it has greater implications for you. And we cannot just speed by this verse and speed by this morning right before spring break and act like, oh, I got that, I'm good, and just run through it. We have to ponder these things. We have to grasp the implications because the sacrificial care God displays in the gospel is compelling. It's compelling us to care for the orphan. It's compelling us to care for the widow. And it's comparing, compelling us to care for the world. That's who God is. He cared enough to restore our families. He cared enough to restore our hope. He cared enough to bring about a change in this world. Who are you going to be? Will you be compelled by his heart? Let's pray. Thank you, God, again, for this morning, for this opportunity that we have to come and, and learn more about who you are, about what you desire for us. Father, I pray and ask that you would use this to bring about change for us, but not change just for our sake, but change so that we can make a difference so that you would be glorified and made great in this world. Father, we ask these things in your son's name by the Spirit. Amen.